Hey everyone, welcome back. On this episode of our podcast, we have Andy Vitali, Director of User Experience at Polaris Industries. Andy's actually here in Minneapolis as well, so we had a chance to catch up with him in person and record this show where we talked about his background a little bit and, of course, got into user research and how you apply that in design and how we do that to help us make evidence-based decisions, which I really love. So we also spent a lot of time talking about the importance of understanding business as a designer. It's important for us to learn and speak the language of our business and stakeholders so we can be successful in helping them, sharing our ideas, doing our best work, and meeting customer needs. So I don't want to spoil it for you. I'll just let you listen for yourself. And quickly before we dive in, I want to share some very exciting news with you all. We're very close to launching Aurelius version 2 out of beta. It's been months and months of hard work, and we're coming up on our big launch. For those of you not familiar with Aurelius, we are user research and insights tool for design and product teams. So we help you add, tag, organize, search, and analyze all of your user research notes and key insights in one place so you can make awesome designs, products, and features. Now, we're still in beta for a few more weeks, at least at the time of this recording, and we're free while in beta. Now, I want to mention this because we're going to have some special offers for our public launch for everybody who's a current beta customer. And these are going to be limited offers uh, that we're only going to give to current beta customers prior to our public launch. And we'll also be limiting the number of some of these things. Again, I don't want to spoil it, but if you're doing any kind of user research or customer feedback work now, you should definitely check us out. Head over to our website and sign up for our beta. So the website, of course, is www.aureliuslab.com. That is A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. Okay, enough of all of that. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to Aurelius Podcast, Episode 16 with Andy Vitali, Director of User Experience at Polaris Industries. Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, Glad yeah. to be here. Oh, yeah. We're happy to have you. So this is a nice and fun one because we actually have Andy in person. He's here in Minneapolis with us. And so we get a chance to actually physically, not metaphorically, sit down and chat with Andy. So that's cool. Uh, and by the way, tonight is like negative 10 outside and all of us made it here in one piece on time. So. I'm not looking forward to the next few days of negative temperatures at all. All right, let's dive right in. I, I know you have an interesting background. Um, you've already warned me that the how I got into design story is quite a long one. Why don't we just say, talk a little bit about the work you've been doing recently, the stuff you've been thinking about. I know you've been giving some talks, uh, thinking about stuff like that. Sure. So right now I'm at Polaris. I've been there for probably just about two months. So I'm still taking my time to understand where design fits, the design maturity level, understand the capabilities of the team, the projects that we work on, the businesses, and kind of how they're structured. So I'm just kind of formulating a plan, just sitting back and taking it all in for now. Before that, I was at 3M, um, worked supporting all six divisions of their healthcare business group, everything from oral care, dental orthodontics through food safety and then health information systems, which is enterprise healthcare software and doing a lot of talks, talking about culture, about to put that one to bed, I think, uh, talking about what makes experiences valuable. And then at the same time, I'm working on a new one about the transition from designer to design leadership. Yeah. Okay. Right on. You know, actually something you just said there struck me, like what makes experiences valuable. And I, I know that you actually did a local talk on that pretty recently what's the reader's digest version there, right? Like what makes experiences valuable? So there's this pyramid that I go by the elements of value pyramid. And really it just talks about how we can provide certain levels of value to our customers. A lot of it is just providing information to them and how do we take that to the next level? And, and the ultimate goal, the pinnacle is like self transcendence and really only companies like Tom's have gotten there where for every time you purchase a pair of shoes, they donate a pair of shoes to someone else. Okay. So it really is about taking the value that you're offering your users and how do you up that one level? So it's it's really interesting. I don't want to give it all away, yeah. but... Um, okay, that's uh, 
it's even then when you said that you said, so the pinnacle is what was again self transcendence self transcendence it almost sounds like uh some analog back to maslow's right hierarchy. exactly yeah, yeah, okay. it, it's very much based on maslow's hierarchy of needs um initially the bottom level is functional okay and it goes from functional to pretty much emotional and then once you have that emotional connection how do you build upon that so Really, though, when you think about what makes something valuable, it's, it's kind of something that's well-crafted. It's something that everybody's proud of. Yeah. It's solving some sort of unmet need. But at the same time, it's something the team is proud of. So it could be like amazingly clean code. It could be like well-crafted design, something that's delightful. But it really does have to solve that user need. Is As you're talking about this, is this really like focused inward on how we make experience is more valuable as a company or is this or does that a mo- is that model applied to customers or, or is it both it, it's probably a little bit of both okay. it should definitely be about customers but it should also reflect them inwardly if possible so if you think about another thing that adds value kind of like i don't know my fitness pal yeah right so that's an app that people kind of track their weight and it gives them little celebratory things it helps them understand like hey i'm going in the right direction it motivates them but really it helps them focus on themselves too so i think that that's probably a good example of of that okay so and so then this is a model that you're at least in the talk kind of sounds like you're saying hey uh recognize these steps um you're at this place where you're you're meeting some like basic need, right? Because that base layer of Maslow's hierarchy is like you need to eat and sleep and have shelter, right? It's right. like exactly. you have to feel safe. It's got to give you the bare necessities of life. And then, you know, in your case, maybe <clears throat> of the experience. Right. 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 And then you graduate up to that, like be able to – or at least only when you've done that well. Right. Only when you've done that well. And a lot of companies do one or two things well. And then essentially – it's about how many of those elements of value on that pyramid can you add? And and you might be okay and it might be good to just provide some sort of reward to customers. Think about Starbucks, right? Starbucks is a great example. I go to Starbucks now because I just love to see those stars and get free coffee every mm-hmm. now and then. I mean, I just feel that I get some sort of value for becoming a member. So they've got this emotional connection with me, even something that I, I didn't really care for them in the beginning. I just, I kind of, it's, They've gamified it a little bit, and I've enjoyed it. Yeah. So. Well, you don't even you know don't what even Starbucks, know what Starbucks, Starbucks sells. sells. You just go there because you like the Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really love the holiday drinks. I, I think I've tried all seven of them this year. Okay. Oh, you, so have, you, have, you actually you know, actually know how many there are, are, and you've tried all so. of them. There was, there was gingerbread, eggnog, um, a new holiday one that had like – I don't know, caramelized or sugarized, the cranberries. Both. <laughs> and then they had the peppermint white chocolate mocha. Okay. That's four. And there's there's others. I... You know, the, the question it makes me think of too uh, is like how do we how do we learn what those things are? Right? So like the base layer stuff um, in some ways should be self-explanatory. But how do we learn about what that progression into the next things are to reach that self-transcendence. Sure. So so basically, the more elements that you provide, the greater you have customer loyalty. And then it kind of helps sustain company growth, right? So it's really providing value to the customer, which in turn provides value to the company. So the more value you provide to your customers, the more the company grows and makes money. Because at the end of the day, the stakeholders are really interested in dollars. Right. Right. So we're talking about, you know, making that transition. So functional would be the first one. And examples of that would be, does it save time? Does it reduce risk? Does it help organize? Does it reduce costs in any way, avoid hassle? The, the basic things that most companies provide. Then from there, you get to emotional. And emotional is kind of this interesting thing. Sometimes something like nostalgia can be really emotional. I mean, we're in a room with a Christmas tree right now. And right. I love Christmas. So I'm kind of, you know. I was in a bad mood from the traffic and I came here and I was like, this is awesome Christmas tree. <laughs> then, then that third level goes to life changing. So things like providing motivation or self-actualization or this sense of belonging. And then finally you get to that self-transcendent peak. Interesting. You know, and it's funny too, because something you said earlier was some, some or most companies actually only do one or two things really well. Right. 
And I think, you know, and I, I would love to hear your perspective on this. My experience is that a lot of designers want to jump to that self-transcendence level. Right. right. When actually there's a whole lot of shit they should be doing in between. Like that, that, that self-transcendence level, even if you nail that now, it actually wouldn't provide any value because you haven't done some of these basic things. Right. right. So basically it's a pyramid. You've got to build that foundation first and you've got to do it well. You've got to be make sure that you can kind of, once you build that ground level, that's when you start to move up. So when that ground level, those elements, those basic functional yeah. tasks are being met, and you're seeing your customers are seeing value in there. That's when you start to strive for what's above that and start to create that emotional connection. So I know in design, we talk a lot about these emotional connections, but really we've got to provide some sort of initial value first. You can't just build this emotional connection. It takes getting to understand and know the customer and spending time with them and understanding their unarticulated needs. So designers are really good at under, at discovering those unarticulated needs. Our business partners, they know all of the pain points, right? They hear about them all the time, sure, sure. but they don't know how to think beyond that and put it all together to really build an experience. It's more about, okay, here's this pain point. How do we fix that? Let's just add a button, add a piece of functionality and not sit back and understand how it affects the experience overall. Yeah. No, okay, so I love this because you're getting into you're getting into that bridge between like design and business. Right. 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 And we have to live happily together. And you're saying, well, look, there's like there's a cutoff point because uh people who are thinking about one thing, maybe on the side of the business, don't necessarily know how to think about the way that affects the experience. The the very thing that we may say is important in our work, right? Right. right. I'm curious, is there a recent example of that happening? that you can kind of describe of like, hey, uh, the business identified a, a problem, uh, a pain point, a need. And then here's how design really ushered in, you know, maybe here's how you or your team or whatever ushered in this this way of helping them see how it affected the experience uh, and, and maybe gave them, the business, a different perspective. Sure. So when I was at 3M working in enterprise software, design was very new to them. So it was a very successful organization did about $800 million a year in business, but it was designed by developers. So yeah, the yeah. business team would go out and understand the pain points and the developers would just come back or, or they'd come back to the developers and say, hey, you know what? We need an ability to sort this work list or we need some way to, to solve this one little complex, what we think is a complex need. But But really, it was very individualized, right? So what they started to do was based on the customer feedback that they had, they would customize features. And <laughs> when you build enterprise software, you can't be everything to everyone. Right. You've got to really start to do proper research to find those trends so you know what to implement. So when we started to add designers to the mix and started to go out and visit customers and spend time with them and kind of co-create with them, show them something, get their feedback, see how they work, live with, you know, live in their environment walk in their shoes as best as we could. Yeah. We're designers. We weren't medical coders, but we had to understand how they worked yeah. and understand their goals and their needs. And by doing that, you figure out that just adding this one button or having them sort things doesn't simplify that experience for them. How do we present the right information to them at the right time when they need it? So we worked closely with them over the course of, I don't know, eight to 10 months to do that. Yeah, And of course, incrementally, we were building things and adding more value as we mm -hmm. went. But we ended up increasing productivity by like 30% just by understanding the workflow and figuring out ways to change that. Yeah. So the, actually, you know, the biggest takeaway I get from what you just said to Andy, keep me honest with this, um, is really, you know, what bridges the gap between business and design? It is research. It's, it's understanding, understanding customers, customers right? right? Uh, and, and kind of what I heard you say too. This is something I know I, I harp on people a lot, a lot. Uh, there's a difference between like doing research and analyzing it. I'm using air quotes right. and synthesizing it. Right. right. So the difference there, right, is it's like it's why analytics are popular. Right. right. It's because you can look at a number and you can go, well, look, page views went up. Like that's a good thing. Like right. we want to take comfort in numbers. That's that's like analysis, right? But the meaning of it, what you were getting to, and what you did, and it sounds like in that project the meaning of why maybe page views went up or something is actually far more important, you know, because one is, as you mentioned, uh, maybe the business and development or whatever, working to react to a problem. The other one is anticipating needs. It's right. a very different, very different world, world, right? Exactly. 
So where I'm at now at Polaris, one of the things that they do is they, they use a lot of quantitative analytics. They've got analytics for almost everything. Mm -hmm. So they know what is happening, but they don't understand why it's happening. Yes. So I'm starting to introduce a lot of like qualitative KPIs and qualitative metrics so that mm -hmm. we can understand like what's happening and, and how do we measure that? And for us, it's, you know, conversion rate. Those are like black and white <clears throat> analytical things. But when you start to get into like, did someone complete a task properly or how do we convert certain things back to dollars that might necessarily be a you know black and white yeah, something yeah. like a gray area is it a project that we might have killed right that we ended up saving money putting time and resources on something else because we weren't going in the right direction and that direction might not have been the design team's fault or the business team's fault sometimes you know the world isn't ready for your big idea yeah, sometimes nice. you make the wrong decision sometimes your execution sucks it's not the right time so you've got to know when to to kill that project stop the bleeding and apply those resources somewhere else you can also do that with just basic simplification right so if you make something easier to use you spend less money training people on how to use totally. it totally and that again frees up time and resources or if you think about a pro something like Excel, right? I suck at Excel. I don't know if you guys You're are looking at the Excel wrong guy. junkies, <laughs> but I um, I just feel like I probably use 5% of the features 95% right, right. of the time. So if you're building software, you're working, even if it's a website, why are you spending dev hours and design hours on something that nobody's using? Yeah. yeah. So if you focus on what's being used, what's important and improving that, then you're going to start to see numbers grow and you'll understand why by spending the time with the users yeah. to make sure that you're matching their mental model and solving their needs. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, uh, you're playing my song. This is, this is the same kind of thing I talk about. As a matter of fact, I'm working, I know I, we mentioned, we chatted a little bit before we kind of started the recording, a uh, talk even I'm working on. Um, and a lot of the talks that I give come back to the same thing of like setting up good goals. Um, because what you're talking about is being able to like quantify the qualitative. Right. We've right. all talked, you know, our industry, we've talked about this for a while, but I don't think anybody's done it well, or I don't think anybody's given the right effort to do right. that well, to help people understand like why the what is happening uh, as you spoke, right? Like you're saying they have measures for this stuff. So they know what's going on, but they don't know the why. Right. And the research really gives you that. Um, just to share with you, I mean, I would love to hear your reaction to this, you know, like setting up good goals for what your product and experience should be, right? So there's this like this statement, uh, somebody on the executive team or whatever, like senior level management says the product or experience should be. And then there's usually some metrics. People usually have metrics like set right. up, like here's the, here's the levers, like here's the things we want to see change. But the problem is there's that middle area, right. which is where we operate. We being designers, product people, right? Primarily. Uh, and it's the thing that, gives us the understanding of why to the what. Right. And those are what I typically call success indicators. So okay. they're things that just give you like deeper detail. Right. right. Not only context for the metric, but also a deeper definition of the why. So an example that might be our goal is we want to get more people signing up for a free trial. Okay. Well, if you and I sat in a room and, and like wanted to jam on that, there's a whole bunch of ways we can go about doing that. Right. Now, if we also knew that the way we were going to measure, quote unquote, the success of that was uh, by page views, um, uh, bounce rate percentage, and uh, number of signups. Okay, fine. But there's that stuff in the middle. It's like, what's the behavior that right. we actually, actually want to want see it. as to why people would want to sign up for a free trial, for example, right. right? And like that, I feel like that's the area we operate in. And I feel like that's kind of what you're talking about here. Is that? It is. And what... What I think I would add to that is what we've done in those situations is kind of conduct this hypothesis workshop. Mm. So we know that the business has these, these grand ideas of things they want to see become reality. And a lot of times it might be very different than what us as designers think might be possible. And, and we are natural to question like value propositions and, and be the advocate for the user. So we would go in and, and spend time with our business team our stakeholders and have them come up with like what are we going to do how are we going to measure it how do we know it's successful yes, yes so. so and then from there like so we're going to do x we will know it's successful well it would actually go we're going to do x for this specific group of people mm -hmm. then we know it's successful by measuring it how 
And we would put together, I don't know, six, seven of these different hypotheses and, and really like detail them out. And then the design team would go and kind of create these little proof of concepts, these low fidelity sketches, mm -hmm. prototypes, and we'd put them in front of customers mm -hmm. to get their feedback, help them have the customers help us prioritize what is important for the business and even roadmap items. So in this case, you're actually using design to facilitate the finding of what those things should be, right? Like right. as you're right. saying, fine, cool. We have the ideas of what this should be. Maybe you even mentioned roadmaps specifically. There's items. Let's take them off their list. Uh, make some lo-fi prototype sketches, whatever it is, right. something to get uh, a temperature check from our customers. Is this even worth pursuing further? That's kind of the way. Right. right. Something to get some evidence-based insights from our customers. I love that term, evidence-based insights. Talk more about like what that means for you specifically and when you're gathering this feedback on that stuff. So what we want to do is, Aside from just doing observational research, we like to put things in front of customers. So if there's some sort of concept that we have that we want to get feedback on, because we know as designers, the first time we put something in front of people, it's not 100% correct. correct. Yeah. Or, yeah, I was going to say maybe like one or two out of a right. million times. But, yeah, it's never right. So what we need to do is is understand the customer and have them react to that. And that evidence that they're providing to us that – this might not be right, or mm. I don't understand the navigation. I can't find things. I don't know where to look. I'm, I get stuck in a certain place. That is providing us evidence towards what problem we're trying to solve. But at the same time, they might turn to us and say, we'll never use this. You know, I have every now and then I have what I think is a great idea of how do we leverage voice for something? How do we leverage some sort of cool like technology for things? And I've learned you can never start with the technology yeah. because the technology will get you in trouble. You're going to try to over, I, I don't want to say simplify because it's the opposite. So you're going to overcomplicate things for users and provide them with things that they don't need. And then you're just going to turn them off. But had you just gone with your gut and built them something that they don't want, then you'd start to see it in your sales numbers that people are not buying what you're selling because they, they're not interested. You're not solving their need. You're creating more of a problem for them. Yeah, well, which is like uh, I remember way back in the day too, I heard some stuff uh, being discussed about this in our industry, almost like the doctor's Hippocratic Oath, right. Right. first do no harm, right? Like, And that's, that's a big deal. And that's kind of what you're talking about. Like first, make sure you're not creating more problems right. Right. through some – what we think is cool or elegant solution uh, because it serves a technology need. And that's, that's obviously very dangerous. So designers are the first ones sometimes and say, you know what, I'm the designer and I'm here to solve your problem. Mm -hmm. And the business is our partner. They're providing this vehicle for us to do what we do. They're providing this opportunity for us to solve these problems and get to know our customers and delight them and, what we have to try to stay away from too is, and, and I'm going on a little bit of a rant, but I feel like designers often come to the business and say, hey, you know what? I'm questioning what you do. And the business gets this feeling like, well, you're the designer. Like you're coming here and telling me how to run my business after I've done things for so long. So yeah. we start to speak the same language and the language of the business. And it really does help designers go to that next level to be able to talk to the business. Those business goals are, and how do we tie those to our user needs and, and marry the two together? Yeah. But we can't give off the impression that we're only being the advocate for the user. The only way to do that is to speak to the business in ways they understand. They want to talk about dollars and they want to talk about conversion rate and things they understand right. and business right. models. And we've got to be able to speak that language to be at the same table as them. I could not agree anymore. Uh, and as a matter of fact, a lot of what, what I've been talking to people about, you know, whatever is like, hey, Zach, can we grab coffee or hey, what's your advice on this or that? Everything I've been telling people is like design is a business. The sooner we start treating it like that, the more successful we're going to be. The conversation used to be, how does design, quote unquote, get a seat at the table? Right. Well, guess what? When you get a seat at the table, you have a choice on what you do with that. And you can either try to roll the hill or roll the roll the boulder uphill, which is going to be really hard. Right. Or you can say, yeah, I'll, I'll get on with this. I'll learn the language. I'll understand what business is all about. And I'll help you see how we help you do that better. Because exactly. the reality of it is, is it can, right? And uh, I, I really like the fact that you broached this topic to say, like, 
we as designers oftentimes come in and we say, no, we know how to solve your problem. Don't argue with me. I'm the designer. I know what it is. Right. It's like, but you've never actually learned. Do you know what their ass is on the line for? Right. Take the time to to really understand your stakeholders and understand your business and, and the customers that they're serving. Yeah, it's totally true. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing, too, the tail end of what you just said, like, uh, what's in the best interest of their customers? There's a lot of people in the business who say that's important to them. Right. But as you mentioned earlier, they don't know how to quantify that, right? Right. Like, exactly. they know it's important to serve customers, but that's why they hire us. So it's actually our job to help them see how serving customers well is good for business. Like that's our job. Right. 100%. It's about gaining these behavioral insights, understanding how our customers behave on a daily basis, what their day-to-day looks like, what their goals are, what problems they have, and figuring out ways to solve them. We're talking and we know it, right? It's yeah. like one-on-one, <laughs> but how do we explain this to stakeholders and under, and let them understand that, you know, we're, we're doing our best to, to marry the two business goals yeah. and, and user needs and really help them understand who their customer is. Because a lot of times some of these decisions are made. So I've seen people come to me. I've seen, you know, directors, C-suite people come to me and say, Hey, you know what? We need to do this. My son was on the site. My daughter was on the site. My <laughs> husband, my wife was on the site and they think that we need to do something. And, yep. and I kind of, I appreciate that fact. I really, even when they try to sketch something out, like I feel like I'm influencing them by getting them to, to try to speak to me in my own language, but yeah. I don't want them to dumb it down for me or yeah. talk to me like, Hey, I drew you this really bad sketch. I know I'm not good at sketching, but this is what I'm thinking of. So at Polaris, we've got a really interesting scenario. All of our employees, our directors, our C-suite, our managers, everyone in the company is is a Polaris rider. They're passionate about the industry. Okay. They understand who that customer is because they technically are that customer to some extent. Right. But then you start to get into the rut of, okay, now we're targeting people that understand our business. But what about the people that are new to our industry? How do we target new customers? How do we distinguish who's a new customer, who's an existing customer? How do we provide the right information to them at the right time based on who they are. And it really is about going back out and spending time at dealerships and understanding who our customers are when they walk through the door. And it's a little bit like reinventing the wheel because the business is focused so long on time. So you've got to stay on top of that and understand how the customer evolves or who your potential new yeah. customer is. Because what you're describing is a little bit of self-design. It's really totally fine if you truly are your customer, it's right. rare, it right? Is. It's extremely rare, but if it's true, have at it, right? Right. However, the point that I hear you bringing up is like, even if you are operating under self design, realize that you will graduate eventually to that self actual or self transing when you're there. Right. You're just like, well, this is me and I'm serving my needs and I am the customer. That's true. You know, the question I want to come back to Andy and ask the, and ask you like, how do we, how have you done that? How have you done, maybe, you know, a recent example? It, it really is about gaining that trust, right? So we have to build that trust with our business partners. Gary Vaynerchuk always says that in any relationship, you want to be the one that gives the 51% to the 49%. So t- sometimes you have to go that extra mile, put your neck out for somebody else. And then in turn, when you come to them and say, you know what? We really do need to understand something more. We need to go in a different direction. We need to spend time to understand the customer more. They kind of, even if they're skeptical and they think that they understand who the customers are, then they're kind of like, okay, well, if this is what you need to do this, then I'm going to go out and I'm going to support that. So it really is gaining influence to to do that, first of all. Uh, once you have that influence, you really do need to make sure that you cherish that, right? So it's not something that you don't you don't want to piss on that influence. You don't want to ruin that relationship. So you've got to continue to add value or provide value. So at that point, you want to point out to them and say, look, you know what? Your customers are changing. They're different. They're not who you think they are. They don't know as much as you do. There's a different segment. We need to go out and spend time to understand them. Yeah. And once you've convinced them of that, and it could be pointing out like, hey, do you know what millennials do with your motorcycle, right? Or might have inherited this snowmobile. 
Do they sell it on Craigslist? Do they keep it? Maybe I want a new one because I have some money to spend. And as soon as you point out something that understand that customer, so you just have to point out what they don't know to them because sometimes they don't see that. Really what we're saying is like gain that trust. Right. And a, another little trick for that is yeah. sometimes if you're new in a company or even just you, what's your vision? Let me use design as a tool to visualize that for yep. you. So they still think that it's their full idea. Now, when it's shared among other people, you're in agreement with that stakeholder, with that product. The room will jump on that same page yeah. too. Yeah, totally. So that step one is gain the trust. I'm really here to help you. Right. The next piece is then saying like, oh, okay, well, I got to wait. Now all of a sudden you can say, I got a way. I know how to help you do that better. Right. Put something in front of them, right? Like all of a sudden you've opened up this world of, I think Andy knows what he's talking about. I think Zach knows what he's talking about. He He's helped me in the past. He hasn't led me astray before. Right. Sometimes we do need to gain that leverage to do the right thing. Yep. This quote from Mike Montero jumped in my head and he's like, your job is be authentic, right? So you, you yeah. do want to solve this problem and yeah. focus on the problems that we have and bringing things to their attention that they might not have, have noticed before. Definitely. Um, but it's like selling your ideas. Throughout my career, people always thought, you're great at selling research. You're great at selling strategy. I said, that's not true at all. What I'm good at is exactly what you talked about. I'm good at helping people see the gaps in their thinking. And I'm good at then saying, well, I know a way to help you with right. that. Because I genuinely want to help them with exactly. that. Exactly. Like if you're not doing that, people people generally speaking, especially in the industry, in the field, in the, in the, in the companies we work with, they're not stupid people. Like you said, they're MBAs. They're people who got to that role for a particular reason, right? And it's like, they know what's important. They can tell. Yeah. It's like, is this, is this guy or gal actually trying to help us? And does that make sense based on what my boss, if I'm the, if I'm the business person, I have to go to my boss and. Right. And, you know, I see that all the time. And, and one of the things that I do is try to say, you know what? I know that you have to go and sell this up the ladder to somebody else and you're accountable for this. Let me go with you. Let me share in that accountability. Design really needs to make sure that they are as accountable for business decisions as anybody else. Yeah. And some places I've worked in the past there, they don't want to be accountable for that. Yeah. And that's why design isn't as mature there as it is in other organizations. And right now I happen to work at a place that design is is trying to grow maturity wise. So we're we're really starting to focus on how do we take the design competencies that we have and and figure out a way to build upon that so that we do grow in maturity and what does design look like you know going forward so it, it's it's been a little bit of an interesting challenge it, yeah it's a challenge and i also love the word maturity of design right right i've had a lot of people come up to me and ask me for advice and i have to tell them point blank i said before we even get into this realize that sometimes design as applied to the company it's just, it's a mismatch in philosophy. Right. You know, and the other part of that though, too, is understand you should sell to the right people. Right. Strikes something in my mind is that design is, is such a passionate thing. That passion is contagious. Yeah. So if you're trying to sell design to somebody, put together a, a vision. Hey, this is my vision for what we could do in five years. It's like a disease. Passion exactly. is contagious. That's absolutely true. Exactly. And you know, another thing that just holiday season, I'm staring at the tree again, and, and I just did this uh, little, you, I don't know, UXmas, if people UXmas, are familiar yeah. with that. So I contributed to UXmas, and it, it's a really long story that I won't get into of how I contributed this article and who it was based on. But I heard, I was listening to a podcast, and someone that was at 3M prior to me created, he spoke, Mauro Porcini is at Pepsi. He talked about loving your users and the difference between just satisfying someone and loving them. And really, it's it's kind of like, think about love in general. It's about loving the person you're with and, and think of our users that way. How do you delight them? How do you make things magical for them? How do you surprise them? How do you, and they see the love and they feel the love. Then as a company, as a business, as designers, they're going to talk about us to other people. They're going to recommend us. They're going to buy our products. They're going to become loyal to love us, not just like us, care about us. Because at the end of the day, the experience will become the key differentiator more so than price and product. Our most recent guest, Indy Young, also talked about love. The question I have for you though, Andy, 
How do we communicate with them? How do we talk with them about why doing that is important? Because this is like mushy, qualitative, right. frou-frou design, you know, quote unquote designer, like genius design stuff that these MBAs and these business people we work with don't quite get down with. Right. It's true. And and it really is pretty important. And one of the things that I like to tie things back to, um, when you talk about Google, right? Everyone's like, Google, they're the best. But is the this Google heart metrics, right? Yes. So yes. how do we tie things to qualitative metrics? And, you know, I don't know, I'm sure your users are, are familiar with it, but basically, you know, the H is for happiness, it's satisfaction, and the E is for engagement, and the A is for adoption, and R is retention, and T is task success. Yeah. These are things that are qualitative metrics that yep. we can measure. And then as designers, it's our job to to convert those also into quantitative. And you know what? The trick is, if you're not great at math, like a lot of designers, yeah. become buddies with somebody in accounting. Yeah. Tom from accounting, he'll understand things like cost per acquisition and what it costs to retain customers. And because as designers, sometimes we, we don't have insight into that math or those numbers. Totally. You know what's really interesting uh, thought that popped in my head based on what you just said? <clears throat> well, so just all first of all, all of this comes back to speaking the learning, number one, right, right. and then speaking the language of business and the people we work with and for. Exactly. That's such a big deal. We can't be so inwardly focused on ourselves and our industry, right. right? But then number two, even like if you don't know the answers to that, making the attempt and showing and showing those people that you're like, what you care about is actually what I care about. Right. right. Goes such a long way. Yeah. It it really does. It you're taking the initiative to understand their problems at the same time and making those problems shared problems. They're not your problems, they're our problems yeah. and we're going to work together yeah. to solve them. The third thing that just popped in my head too is like uh so cuz something central theme of what we've been talking about too right now is empathy. Right. Something that popped in my head right now, Andy, is that amp- empathy as a designer should extend farther beyond our customers so far as to say it's necessary if you want to be at the highest levels of success as a designer. Exactly. And, you know, when I was working in healthcare, it really, this empathy versus sympathy versus compassion was this. And doctors talk about how they can't really have empathy for customers because they have to have compassion. And there's a lot of psychological studies on what the differences are. And at the end of the day, yes, as designers, we have a better opportunity of being able to step into our user's shoes than could with a patient who's dying of cancer. So I can understand where that gets to be harder to absorb and take in. But at the end of the day, it really is about putting yourself in that mental state, that situation, the behavior of your customer and figuring out how how they work and how they navigate through these scenarios that come up. So even when we start to design for patients, we do need to understand that emotional state that they're in and and create that emotional investment. And sometimes that can be for us draining, but it's our job and it's our job to help them solve their needs. Now, 90% of the time, if you're lucky, design isn't life or death situations. You know, in healthcare, it is one little mistake can cause somebody to die. So we really do have to understand all of the players and, and have that empathy and at least as deeply as we can understand their situation, what worst case scenario looks yeah. like for them. We need to be aware of all of that and still try to provide potentially what, what best case scenario is for them too. Yeah. Well, you know, so the uh, the cool thing that I've been reminded of and, and just that uh, that bit that you shared, Andy, is that like I've talked with teams about this is to find – oftentimes to find the optimal solution. Right. You use the anti problem. And I don't know. So there's some of us who uh, are listening to this podcast are probably familiar with this. Dave Gray and Game Storing book, The Anti Problem. A brief synopsis of this. The anti problem is basically saying force people to brainstorm what the worst case scenario is. Right. So if we're trying to solve X, what's the worst thing we can do to solve? Like what, what, what can we do to actually make X worse? Right. Because interestingly enough, when you find that the edge of the, I've always called it the edge of the cliff right before you fall off. One step backwards is sometimes the most interesting and innovative solution. Right. Yeah, I can definitely see that. And a lot of times, even when designing things like a navigation or 
when you start to, you know, enterprise software, you start to go into what is this worst case scenario? How do we solve for this? Now I'm super fortunate. Providing that fun is is an emotion. It's an emotional connection. It's, I can make sure that you can find our vehicles and buy them, but are you having fun riding them? Or who? Yeah. I I just kind of went full circle because we were talking about like healthcare and worst case scenarios, yeah. and I wanted to lighten it up a little bit. Yeah. But the truth is, as designers, we we see the best and worst of things, and it's up to us to make sure that we're able to overcome them and have successes through them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, I think even speaks to the, the, this concept of like the whole experience where you were talking about this a little bit earlier too, like understanding business decisions you make are not, uh, acute, right? right? They're not just point in time. It's where the things you do now actually can live with people in their lives surrounding, uh, the experience they have directly with our products and even beyond that. Right. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's, it's the exponential impact of, of people. It's yeah. if, if I have a bad experience with something, I'm going to tell you and, and you, it might come up in a conversation you have and it's going to just multiply over time. And it's the same thing with a good experience. If, if I have a great experience, I'm going to share that with you. And then you're going to share that with people, you know, and it's going to all tie back. So as we work on building experiences, we want to make sure that people are talking about us in a positive way and sharing those experiences, not the bad things that are happening to them. Yeah. Where as designers, we kind of play in that middle where either could happen. And we want to make sure that we spend enough time understanding our customers and getting that going back to research, yeah. doing that research and understanding what their fears are so that we make sure that, that we don't have them meet those fears. Research is the key to understanding people. And, you know, when we talk about research again, it's really going back to that, this evidence based decisions that we make. I love that so much. I know I want to be respectful of your time. Um, Andy, is there anything you'd like to share with people, stuff you're working on, things you're thinking about, upcoming deals? Yeah, so I've got a lot of interesting things that, that are happening that I really can't share yet, but I'm really grateful to have become a partner of Adobe's. Uh, worked on probably about 10 different things with them this year, a uh, series of videos, articles, uh, one that really stands out. They called me a superhero designer because of what I was doing in healthcare. Uh, super grateful to the team at Adobe XD. And I really do love that software. It allows me as someone that's not doing as much hands-on design work to put things, ideas that I have onto the computer in a way that I can communicate that message to my design team, to my business partners, um, whether that be through, you know, just some quick wireframes all the way through mockups, something clickable, record those clicks, send a video out, let people see what I'm thinking of. So definitely big fan of XD. Uh, I know Envision's got some, some cool software coming out too. Uh, other than that, I've got a website that basically is, is garbage, right? It's just <laughs> literally a quick bio of me and a list of the articles that I've been involved in the past year or two. Uh, some speaking engagements I've had and some previous ones with links to all of that. Super active on Twitter, uh, at Andy Vitali. That's probably the best way to reach me. And other than that, I take a lot of food pictures on Instagram, same handle. Um, that's enough plugs for me. I would love to shout out to Polaris Industries, um, Indian motorcycles, off-road vehicles. It's cool as shit. It's a cross between a motorcycle and a fucking car, right? It's a three-wheel. I haven't ridden one yet, but... That's that's us. All right. That's Andy Vitali. I can vouch for his food pictures on Instagram. I've been following him for, uh, for a long time now since he's come to Minnesota, as a matter yeah. of fact. And uh, that's all we got. Andy Vitali, thank you very much for joining us. It's been an awesome conversation. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. All right, everybody. We will see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a rating on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to our podcast. And also, you can fill out our podcast survey where you can let us know if someone awesome that we should have on the show and even tell us about the things you would want to hear about, topics that are interesting for you. You can check that out in the show notes or on our website.
Thanks for listening to Aurelius Podcast, talking about product strategy and design strategy. We are the first platform of its kind to help you solve the right problems for your customers and your business and build products and services that truly matter. You can check us out at AureliusLab.com. That is www.A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. You can check us out on Twitter at Aurelius Lab and Instagram Aurelius Lab. We'll see you next time.